we always start slideshows with our mission, vision, and some of our core values and what we hold um, valuable to our farm. And I just let, me let people take a peek at that before I go on. But we're in the central stands of Wisconsin, which when you look at the state, it's the very middle. And uh, very sandy soils. It's where Glacier Lake, Wisconsin was. Uh, when I've got a picture of our soils right here. If you look here, that's beach sand. That is, I joked to my husband, when we finally have a child, uh, and finally it's coming soon, <laughs> when we want a sandbox, we'll just dig down and pull the sand out and fill our sandbox with the sand from the ground. So we're about 3,300 acres. We're all under center pivot irrigation. Um, we grow a variety of crops. In the 51 years as a farm, we've grown over 35 different vegetable crops. Um, what I want to talk about today in the practices and the crops we use and what we do, um, they might be very different for your soils and your farm and your location. But just thinking about the concepts overall is what would be really great to have that conversation with. Uh, we, we try and focus ourselves in, in when we want to do a practice or incorporate a new practice, we want to think about the, the financial aspect, of course, but it's also, is this good for the soil? Is this meeting our um, soil health initiatives? Is this, what is the best practice, not just for us and what we think, but what is out there in the world? Uh, another thing is we put in 14 acres of pollinator habitat in our corners. It's something we've seen through the years uh, that the pollinator habitat has really increased our vegetable production and reduce pests. And some of the, we're incorporating this into our intercropping that we've got on our farm now. And this has been really, um, it started out as something we felt good about. And now that we're realizing that there are uh, farming benefits to having this pollinator crop, it's just been kind of exciting. And I feel really excited that we're doing it. Oh, we do a lot of research on the farm. So it didn't just start with me. Uh, it's been very historical on our farm that we do quite a bit of things. A really nice full circle for us is working with NDVI data. So you, on vegetable crops, you don't get a lot of yield data, even on some soybean crops. If you don't have a harvest head with a monitor, you won't get uh, yield results. So we use a, a drone and get NDVI images so that we can have a bird's eye view of what's happening on the field and have some, some sort of idea of what, what can we improve on or is there trouble spots in the fields that we need to scout. Um, and that research actually was ground truth with NASA on our farm with three other farms in our area. And that's sort of a really nice full circle for us. So. And we were allowed to talk about it in 2008, apparently. We found the non-disclosure in our safe and didn't realize that we had that, that uh, my husband's grandfather found. It was pretty cool. I've got it in my files of things I want to frame. Um, so we started transitioning in about 2015, 2016. We also bought some virgin ground that we developed into organic land. Uh, my focus isn't on transition, but I wanted to sort of put our philosophy and why we're doing it. A big reason why we went to uh, organic, there's the market demand, but it was also because with all of the vegetables we've grown in the past, there aren't a lot of herbicide, insecticide, or fungicide options always. So we, a lot of our crops are already uh, basically farming organically. Not to the full extent, but it was a much easier leap for us to get there and think about. And it took some, some planning and trying to decide how we were going to do it. Some of our philosophy was the fields we chose were some of our lowest performing, lowest yielding, and worst looking fields on the farm. <laughs> and we chose the fields. The reason we chose those was our philosophy was they, they needed the most help. They needed the most attention. Rather than just saying, oh, this field, it doesn't do well, we'll just, you know, soy, corn, soy, corn, and just really not have to worry about it. Instead of doing snap beans, sweet corn, higher value crop, we wanted to really focus and say, what can we do to remedy these fields and take these low revenue centers on our farm and move them up into a medium or high revenue center on the farm. So identifying our revenue centers of fields was important for us. Um, and the... A lot of our poorest performing fields have the highest weed bank, which when you're starting with organic, you might hear pick your fields with the lowest weed bank, but we picked the ones with the highest. So it was 
interesting for us to get going on that. When we picked the highest fields with the highest weed banks, we just put those in cover crops for two years. Um, wasn't every field every year that we did that, we made sure we had to broaden that spectrum that, okay, we really want to transition this one field, but because of revenue or markets or being able to run your business pro profitably so we can farm the next year, we needed to rotate what we were putting in the cover crop. Um, we practiced some small scale trials with organics and conventional. We're very lucky that we are con have conventional ground. A lot of the things we try for um, organics, we first try on our conventional ground because if we mess up, we, there's a little bit more savings there to come back with an herbicide or a fungicide or press that easy button there uh, rather than risking some organic ground. Uh, s slowly is another thing. We, we put first put, I think, 400 acres into transition our first year. That was a lot. Um, so. I'd always suggest maybe a little slower um, than putting a lot in transition. And when you're looking at organic and transition, whether it's transition or you're inorganic, breaking down your cost of production and understanding that it's going to be a different ball game in terms of uh, amendments, especially. So more front loading your compost, front loading manure, front loading a little bit more of these amendments that are going to cost you more and it's gonna be a three year return rather than a single year of putting down like a 32% nitrogen or something. So really understanding some of these um, cost uh, considerations when looking at transition. But we're here to talk about weed management and the first thing I wanna talk about is sort of the philosophy of how we're managing weeds. One is to have that clean field, so tilling and cultivating and keeping that crop is the only green thing in the field and the other one is reducing your cultivation and tillage so planting into an existing crop uh, roller crimping interseeding just a variety of different uh, options that you're going to have for planting this crop something else with the tillage when we have a really pesky crop so some of the fields we transitioned had really bad quack grass um, i don't know if that's a problem in any way does anyone have quack grass as a problem in their area so what we did was we would take one of the fields we actually, it was out of production for a year. We uh, basically dissed it and then we took our turbo till and we'd let the quack come back, come back and turbo till over it the next week and just keep hitting that quack grass. It is now one of our cleanest fields because we took it out of production for the year. We were tilling it every week, uh, shallow tillage to break up those, um, this, what are they, the stomas or I forget what they called, the little, Rhizomes, thank you. Uh, we wanted to break those up and, and prevent them from spreading and becoming overbearing. And it's a very clean field for us. So we did that uh, June and July, August 1st, we put a heavy cover crop down on it. And the next year we put it into production. So it was a really um, important for us to get it clean and get it so we could make it uh, more easily managed in an organic and rotation. So that was something that was in so a consideration when you're looking at that is how could you manage the weeds better. So when you're looking at reduced cultivation or reduced tillage, one of the things we've been working on on our farm is using a non-vernalized dry, which is a fancy way of saying it's not going to go through a frost period uh, and, and go into a reproductive state. So when we start with this, we start with a clean field, either it was cover cropped or uh, we try and cover crop through the winter, but if it if we didn't have time in the fall to do cover crop, it'll be a brown field. But when we start, we we've been putting this non-vernalized rye. We've been spreading broadcast spreading it anywhere from a bushel and a half to three bushels. We're finding our sweet spot is about two bushels per acre. Uh, we've been spreading it ten days, five days, and zero days before planting, and we're finding that. The five days before planting or at planting is some of our better yielding and less weedier fields. Um, I don't have the yield numbers for this last year yet, but it, they'll be coming. <laughs> if you're interested, you can email me, and once we have our yield results, I can email those out. So we, we go through, we uh, broadcast the rye, whether it's before planting or day of planting. We're planting on 22-inch rows uh, with a John Deere planter. 
And then we are tine harrowing that rye in. And that's just to give it an incorporation. And we typically are tine harrowing diagonally across this field. So once you've planted and before crops emerge, it's usually called a blind cultivation. We try not to go with the rows, try and go across the field, go a different angle than you're coming from. Because once those crops emerge, you're, you're sort of trapped to go down those rows. Yes? So when you five days before, before sunrise, that rice is staying on the surface? Well, we, we'll tine harrow it in right away. Right away. Yep. Uh, the reason we were doing some more timing issues is we're irrigated, so we can put it down and irrigate it, make sure it's wet, and we said, okay, what if someone doesn't have irrigation? How should they be able to, could they put it on before, and how well would that do? And it still works. You just have a little less options in early cultivation when those soybeans emerge. So we still, once those soybeans emerge and the rye has emerged, we'll still go through with our tine harrow, and we'll capture any of the other little weeds coming up that aren't a um, rye or a soybean. So the tine hair has been a very important tool and I've got some pictures of that later on our farm and we're looking th for this coming year at a second tine hair. We're using it so much on the farm. You have a question? Um, that's why we go on a heavy rate. So we know we're taking out some rye. Once a rye hits a certain point you can also uh, kind of damage it so it tillers actually a little more and you actually have a little bit more rye from from damaging that um, but we go on a higher rate knowing we're going to lose some as we tine here across the field same thing for soybeans once they are emerged up to about v4 we're tine here and diagonally still across this field and that's just because if you're planting at a higher rate let's say 200,000 seeds per acre and you say I'm gonna have a 20 percent loss then you can hit your target population. So plan for plant senescence or plant damage when you're cultivating um, field. So something we did plan for was plant senescence when we roller crimped. We planted into a standing uh, rustic rye and about, was it three weeks later, two weeks later, we roller crimped that rye on top of that soybean. So the soybeans were emerged at V2, V3 and we thought we'd kill about 20% of our soybeans by roller crimping on top of it, and we killed 1%. So we had a very high population of rye. The entire farm came out to see how many, uh, how many plants I would kill as I ran them over. And it just, it's, it's something that's not, um, it's gaining popularity, I think, roller crimping over top of the, the living plants, and it's something we're finding is working for us. You can see here that we had grass weeds coming up between the rows, but the soybeans at that point were already before V5, you know, hitting, getting a little taller. And while it wasn't a clean looking field, you could still see grass coming up through some of the soybeans, which eventually died before we harvested. It, it was a very low uh, maintenance field for us in terms of uh, dividing all of our assets and where they need to go. Um, the roller crimping is, something we're going to plan on doing more this next year, and we're going to incorporate vetch into that as well. There's a question? Can you talk about the trip tomorrow? What's the previous crop? When you get that rye the So we're typically planting a rye. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was repeating the question. I'm sorry. Uh, a brief reminder that we'll have time for Q&A after the session. I don't mind if there's questions now. That's okay. Um, so... Our rotation is interesting. Um, we have, I mean, though, yeah, the question is um, when we're planting rye in the fall, what crops we're following with our, the next year's crops. Um, did I capture? And the previous crops. Um, on our farm with our organic rotation, we're doing a corn, soybean, uh, vegetable crop, including snap beans, sweet corn, peas. We've got quite a bit of dry edible beans in our rotation. So that's kidney beans, gray white northerns, or pinto beans. The rotation we try and follow, and it changes every year with that many crops in rotation, is going to be a corn, a, a dry bean, a soybean, a sweet corn, uh, then probably a snap bean, or another dry bean, or a soybean. So we're trying to break up our, our legumes a little bit more but because we don't have small grains in our rotation, which we would like to add, to add a more diverse picture, 
we're typically doing a grass or a corn and then two years of a legume and that second year is typically a soybean because they perform better after a bean on bean rather than a dry bean or a snap bean. So it's, it's coming off of a, um, this field was following a dark red kidney bean field, this field here, when we roller crimped. The dark red kidney bean field was harvested uh, sept late September of last year. It was a very good year for harvest, and we were able to get a really nice cover of an aroostook rye down. This year, if, you're in, you, if you watch the news, Wisconsin was hit with a lot of rain. Um, we had, within two weeks, about 15 inches of rain, and then we had rain about every three days, so we had a really hard time harvesting our beans. We had beans coming off late October, and putting some kind of cover crop down was very difficult um, for us to be able to get it established. We did actually spread rye on some of the fields we didn't think would come up. Walking them this winter, we have some green rye on those warm days actually coming, and we think our stand will be pretty poor which means we probably are not gonna roller crimp those fields if we had planned on it. So it's having that backup plan. Our backup plan would be to till down that rye, put in an oats with a vetch, and either mow or crimp that. So trying some different practices. So how long have we been crimping and what's the success with that? This is our, uh, in an organic system, in an organic system, this is our second year trying this. Um, for a conventional system, we have been roller crimping for five years now, uh, and then strip tilling into a, our roller crimp system. That's uh, another tool that we really like to use to get a really clean seed bed, and that's because when you're, we usually use this roller crimp system in our conventional fields with our uh, vegetable production. And vegetables are really finicky about seed to soil contact, so we strip till into a roller crimp. I've got a picture of that a little bit later. Not quite, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, in addition to the roller crimp system or spreading that non-vernalized rye, a note on the non-vernalized rye, our operators who do a lot of our cultivation for us have go past our trials. So the first year we did 15 acres. The second year we did 30, and this last year we did like, I don't know, 60 or 70 acres. Um, they have gone by these half pivots now and go, why aren't we doing this on every single field in the farm? They're seeing that there's less weeds and there's less you know, stress of, okay, we need the tine hero here and we need the um, s tine or the souk up here and we need these, all these cultivators, all these different places. And they, our operators are saying, come on, guys, let's speed it up a little bit because it's working well. Um, and we tend to speed it up now that it's been working well. Uh, something else we're doing is interseeding. We've been doing that uh, two years now, so it hasn't been too many years. We're finding it to be really valuable. We went ahead and built our own interseeder here. Uh, my father-in-law sometimes get ideas and we just go for it. Uh, we took uh, an old Lilliston cultivator, so that's where you see these spider reels from, so we can incorporate the cover. And we had some gandy boxes laying around and made ourselves a little three row. This is us going into corn here really late. Uh, we actually did get a cover crop stand. It wasn't fantastic, but it was okay. Mostly the peas and the teff grass came up. The collards and the clover really didn't do very well. And I think it was just, it was a pretty late interceding into that. And we plan on actually doing a lot more interceding, not just on our organic, but our conventional ground as well. Um, and we have to just be more aware of the light capture and the timing that we're putting some of these cover crops in. So it's something else to think about is you know, how much light capture do you need? At what stage can you put a cover crop without damaging your cash crop? And when, you know, what's your end goal? Our end goal is to, after these late seeded, our late harvested crops, that we have a green cover crop on the field so we don't have another tillage event to either take, you know, the, the last crop's residue under and put a new crop on. and we save a little bit of money there and soil health in terms of not disturbing that um, growing region. So, uh, what, we've done in our, what we've done in our vegetables, and we're really excited to do a lot more of it, um, in our cucumbers this last year. So this is cucumbers here. This is the interseeded cover crop. I have a picture of the end rows where there was no cover crop that established very well. And you see lamb's quarter, ragsweed, 
just, you know, pick your weed and it's sitting there. It's, it was a pretty weedy field. Um, this is also one of the fields we had a really big issue with quack grass because it's a rented field. We didn't take a season to get that quack grass out. We decided to put our cucumbers here because it's a later plant. So we could do about three weeks worth of trying to get rid of that quack grass and then go ahead and hill and make our beds and put an intercrop, inter, um, interseeded cover crop there. So that was one of those choices on what crop is going into what field and with that cost breakdown slide, you know, your rental fields, how do you manage an organically rented field when you've got three years worth of amendments or a lot of costs into what you're doing. Uh, so we did uh, the buckwheat, kale, non-vernalized rye, and that, I think there was crimson clover in that too. I'm like positive there was, and I just didn't type it in there. Um, for organic cucumbers, we did not spray. There is organic insecticide and organic fungicide. We didn't spray anything actually on this field. We didn't have cucumber beetles. We didn't have disease until the last week we were harvesting, which was about the second, third week of, of September. And that's a pretty late harvest for cucumbers. Um, we think that the, our scouts that we hire from another service just could not believe that there was no disease and no pests. And we, if you walk down into this field, you know, anywhere from beginning of July to August, all you heard and saw was bees and all these insects just all over the field. So having that other, you know, a side benefit of this intercropping, our first goal was weed suppression. And we didn't realize our second goal was pest and disease reduction. So that's something we definitely plan to incorporate a lot more. Uh, we'll be putting that on the cucumbers this next year, peppers and watermelon. And we're probably gonna do a small trial eggplant and we'll put something in with the eggplant too and see how it goes. What the issues we had, we had way too much buckwheat. Our cover crop was up to here. And so when we started to harvest, it was, you know, jungle. Um, getting through that and finally the last uh, four acres that we harvested we just took our uh, big swisher mower and we just mowed because it was it was really difficult to get through there so this next year we know all of our covers that are going to go on crops that we have to hand harvest or that we can't have this really tall cover that we're going to just we've got to either plant a low growing crop or you have to plan on mowing so I still think it'd be cool to put a mower on you know, a big toolbar and mow like several swaths. So the other philosophy is when you're cultivating and starting with a clean field. Um, some of the tools we use, we actually don't have a lot of full tillage tools. We have a disc. We have a Reuben Lemkin, a Reuben 9 Lemkin. I always figure out how to say that. Uh, and a turbo till. And then we have two strip till units. So our full tillage units, we only have three on the farm for managing about 3,300 acres. And the reason we don't have a lot of that is our goal is not to have to till all the time. Our goal is to reduce our tillage overall on our farm, reduce tillage, reduce herbicide, especially in our conventional. But in organics, we don't want to have to be tilling all the time or have to plow or have to really damage our soil structure. Um, so that's why we don't have full tillage, a lot of full tillage tools. And that uh, Reuben 9 has been incredibly versatile for us. We can till a really heavy cover two or three inches under the soil. So we can take this robust cover that's standing thigh height, turn it under. We'll go two passes. I know there's farmers that are able to do an under one pass, but we, we'll go through with two passes. Um, so when we talk about cultivating, once you get your clean field, put in your crop, do some blind cultivation with your tine harrow or whatever tool you have to run across that ground. Um, we'll start our row cultivation. Here's our tine harrow. You can see that here. That's actually in pinto beans. Have you guys done tine harrow over your beans? No. This is Haley. They, they grow some dry beans over in Wisconsin. All right. We were told not to do this. It works. It totally works. You're going to damage plants. Definitely, we planted at a higher rate. Um, you're going to damage plants, pull plants out. Um, you can see a little bit of the wheat, some leaves here in the ground. But in terms of being able to prevent the weed growth in a dry bean crop, that is more valuable to us than damaging some plants. 
Um, and that soybeans, I mean, they could take a beating. Dry beans, you got to be a little more careful with. Um, another early cultivation tool is a rotary hoe. So it's going to have some spider wheels and then some shovels on it as well. It can be more aggressive depending on how you adjust it. It can also throw dirt. Some of your goals when cultivating is throwing dirt. And you want to throw dirt into, depends, but typically into your intro row so that you're bearing any little weeds, but you're not bearing your crop. So you, you adjust your, your cultivators to have this a little bit of uh, angle on it so you can throw dirt where you want to grow. Typically what we do is we'll go through Cultivate so we throw dirt um, on the plant, and then we cultivate and we throw dirt in the middle of the row. Then we'll cultivate and throw dirt on the plant, so we kind of go back and forth. Um, and those are, so the, and the rotary hoe has been on the farm since I think the 70s. So it's been something we've been using for many years and is a very valuable tool for us. Like I said, the tine hero is something we're going to get a second one that's been really invaluable with our organic production. Um, uh, some additional row cultivators. I don't know if my. We have a. It's called a, su a rigid sue cup, and it's got finger. Does the video play? Do you know? We can try it. Not great quality, but you can see these finger weeders that are right there. Ooh, that's really fun. I can see if it can replay if you guys like. Um, but the, the, the sue cup has got some shovels on it. So it's got um, these almost duck feet shovels that are going through the ground. And then we put some finger weeders on it. And the finger weeders, this is not adjusted very aggressively here. You can see it's still hugging the outside of these older crops. We've used the finger weeder on corn, soybeans, dry beans, basically any crop that we've grown that we can cultivate. And we adjust the finger weeders to, you know, just barely touching or barely getting the intro row. And we've adjusted it to their overlapping. So we're actually hitting, plants are getting caught between these fingers as we're cultivating. They're a flexible rubber, so they're not really ripping out your established crop as long as you're cultivating it at a late enough time. Um, but it can, it can really get these little germing weeds out of your intro row and is a very great tool for that. Again, you're going to have some soil or some crop loss. Plan on having cultivator blight or crop loss so you can continue doing this. And you could see, well, you can't see in the picture very well. We did have grass coming up the, um, in the soybeans, but it was not, it was fairly considered fairly clean for us. Um, this is our rolling, uh, rolling Lilliston cultivator. Uh, it's just basically got spider wheels on it. There's a lot of adjustments you can make with a Lilliston uh, in terms of how close and how aggressive you want to get to your rows. This is a snap bean field. Snap beans are really pitiful, really tiny, vulnerable plants that hate being cultivated and will die when you blow on them. Um, so when you're cultivating them, you, you typically want to be careful. Um, but with a Lilliston, um, it's, it can be adjusted so you can get really tight to those rows. Um, and it won't throw a lot of dirt as long as you have, you adjust it. You can adjust it straight so it doesn't throw dirt. You can also adjust it so it does throw some of that dirt. Um, we typically are out adjusting it every third row. Um, just because you can make a lot of adjustments and if you want to spend the time to do this on a higher valuable crop, you go ahead and get out and you make those, you carry around your little pouch of wrenches and get out and adjust your rows a bit. So, Some of our other cultivators is a Danish tine and a sea shank. This is our Danish tine here. This is in dark red kidney beans. Uh, this is it looks like it's corn silver. It's not. It, it was a newly cleared field, so that's actually wood chips and some of the other trash left over from, you know, clearing some virgin ground. Um, and the the Danish tine and the sea shank can be quite aggressive, depending on how you're adjusting your cultivator, how deep you're running it. You can run a sea shank in a heavier ground with this uh, sort of a low-profile shovel. 
And what you're going to be doing is lifting up the ground and putting it back down. So that, that can be where you are really cutting off these roots right below and you're not having a lot of soil disturbance on the top. Um, that's been a method we use. You can also adjust it so they're pointing more like this and they're throwing that, that dirt's moving around the shovel. So that's um, another way that we use the Danish thyme or the sea shank. The sea shank, you don't want to use too early if you use a sea shank cultivator. Um, for me, I don't know why they're so different, but I think the sea shank and the Danish thyme look incredibly similar. The sea shank just has a lot more meatier, um, uh, basically, shanks on them. So bigger shanks, bigger shovels, you want to use those when you have older crops. And that's sort of what I have through. Is there any questions or any slides I should go back to? Um, Mm -hmm. We're not happy. With no. It. We see erosion there. Uh, it, it breaks down soil health. Mm -hmm. uh, any ideas on that? What you're going to try next, uh, uh, or is, is this what it is? Of course, you know, Roundup. But if you're doing an organic crop, then that's not an option. What, what are your thoughts on that part? So the question is, when we have an issue like quack grass, and you're having to constantly till that. What do, you, what do you do if you're seeing soil erosion or a reduction of soil quality? Is that a good yeah. summarization? We've been using that method for quack grass for a lot of, a lot of years. Um, and I think the reason we've been doing it for a lot of years is with vegetable crops, you have a lot of restrictions in your contract of what type of herbicides you can use before a crop. So we have to get rid of quack grass a different way. Um, we, do see, we do see wind erosion. We'll see a, a decrease in your crop yield for the next two years. So that's why we went to um, taking a month or two to get the ground you know, as free as we can of quack grass and then putting a heavy cover crop on it. I think just resigning yourself to having, saying, okay, after I get rid of this quack grass, my number one goal is soil health. So that might be cover, putting a heavy cover crop, putting a compost, Treating that cover crop like a crop, so putting soil amendments, putting on full years of crop nutrients on it might be a way to help with that. Um, I don't know if anyone else has maybe a comment to that on how they could handle quack grass without seeing a reduction in wind erosion or soil erosion or soil health. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a pain in the neck of a, a pest that you've got to take care of that it's just... When we do it, we just feel so bad down in our soul having to take care of it, but there's no other way that we can try and get, that we've thought of to get a clean field. Maybe burning it. I don't know if using a flamer would be one. No, don't use a flamer. We're thinking about getting a flamer on the farm uh, and possibly one of the eco-weeders that zap weeds. So those are two we're looking at possibly adding. Any questions or advice on those two machines? <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, separate question. Your Tuca cultivator with the time meters on it, I think you said your 22 inch rows. Can yep. you speak to what uh, sweep width you're using on your Tuca rear mounts as well as finger weeders? What's your experience been with them? Can you go a little bit more in detail on the finger weeders? Sure. So on the Tuca, I believe we have four in two four inch shovels on there. Um, I'm not the um, operations manager on the farm. So I have sort of basic knowledge on the exact name of the shovels and exact widths, but they aren't big shovels on our Sukup. They're pretty small, and we use two or three of them in a row. I'd have to look at the other picture, and if it's the Danish China or Sukup that I'm thinking of. Uh, but the finger weeders, what we're finding is that each crop can handle a little bit more aggressiveness. So we'll use it on corn, uh, about V3, adjusting them to really hitting that stalk with the corn. We're also using, when we use that finger weeder for those crops and we really know we're going to get really close to that plant, we're trying to cultivate at a really hot temperature. So when those plants are just a little bit more flexible, maybe they're a little bit water stressed, they're, they have a little bit of give and we're not cracking things off of them. So we're really picking our times that when we're using that 
to get it. Um, we find that if your target is grass, using your finger weeder, you can't, you can't let the grass get bigger than this because the finger weeder can't grab it robustly enough to rip it out intra-row in between your plants um, unless, you, unless you say, okay, I'm going to be okay to, to lose a lot of my plant stand because you have to hit that grass early with the suka. Broad leaves, it, it can handle, it can rip broad leaves out pretty, pretty well. Even in soy, I mean, the soybean's a broad leaf, but the soybean can handle a lot of abuse there. Did I, is there any other specific question you have for that? Those are Einbach, so the finger readers we use are Einbach. Yep. Are you cultivating this on guidance or guide hitches? So yes, if you're cultivating on guidance, we do use guidance RTK. Um, we're not using any camera or light guidance in the back of our cultivator. Um, it's something we've talked about adding to reduce the loss of our crop sand, because we do see cultivator blight. Um, whether that's just mechanical damage or you see an introduction of a disease, whether that's a brown spot or a rust. Um, we haven't added that yet. I don't, think we've, I don't think we've reached that economic threshold where we say, okay, we need to get that camera guided. You had a question here. Mm -hmm. The cover. So the question was, um, elaborating more on a roller crimping experience, what happens when you want to roller crimp and you can't? What's the plan B? And then is there um, additional besides rye that we're roller crimping? Okay. Um, so the first year we roller crimped, we got an aroostook rye that was not clean and came with vetch seed, and we thought, oh, no. Um, now we purposely buy our rye with vetch seed in it. Um, not a lot, just a tiny bit, but that vetch grows up enough to grab that rye and really lay it down. So even if there isn't the rye all the way to anthesis, so, you know, your, your field gets to anthesis, not every piece of rye is in the anthesis, so you're going to have rye that sticks back up. We feel that vetch kind of mats those down a little bit more. Oh, I think it's like 8, eight 10%. It's a really tiny a little bit you don't need a lot of vetch for it to you know get out there and grab everything um, we have had issues where we want to plant and we need to plant because our crop needs to go in that first week of june june 1st june 2nd june 3rd and you know the the rye is just slow like holy cow let's go um, when that happened to us the first year we took a mower out and we mowed and bailed uh, a half so about 30 acres of the field and then the other 30 acres we mowed and left um, we had more weeds on where we mowed and baled for sure uh, it wasn't where it was definitely less weeds than a bare field would have been on the mowed and mulch side it was it was just it was as if we had roller crimped it yep we had really nice mulch down our plan b is yep Yep. Yep. Mowing and mulching it down. Um, we, since having that experience where that rye just wasn't getting to anthesis, we decided that we need to treat in the fall. Uh, one year we tried to treat the rye in the spring as a crop by adding nutrients to it. That just made it take longer to go into anthesis. So the other year, the next year, we went ahead and treated it in the fall like it was a crop. So putting some soil amendments on, some micronutrients whatever we thought that particular field at that weather point, what it needed. So there isn't really a prescription that we're using. We're going out and kind of scouting and seeing what's needed. And treating it like a crop in the fall, we, it seems to be a lot more consistent in the spring um, is what we're also finding. Um, what else with roller crimping? Was there a roller fertilizer you could put on this time of year? The, so the question is, in this, is there a winter fertilizer we can use? In our sands, there's not a lot that we're uh, allowed to actually use. 
Um, it would be fantastic. I think we would use that tool if we could. Uh, but that's definitely looking at all your tools in the toolbox at what you can do to be successful for that, for that crop. Um, so this is actually uh, strip tilling into that rye. And this, we strip till into it three times, actually before we have, I wonder if I've got a picture of that rye. I don't know if I do. Um, it, it looks really clean when we roll a crimp. And it's because those nice brown strips through that field. Uh, we've strip tilled three times to get that. We tried doing it twice, and you get a really clotty, clumpy, and that rye is really robust. It's, it's grabbing a lot of dirt, and that creates just not a great seed bed. Um, I think for corn or soy, I think it would probably work better, uh, but for dry beans or our vegetables, we need a pretty clean seed bed for that. Uh, we started with that roller crimping with our pumpkin crop, so we're in 44 inch rows with, you know, 40, 40 some odd inches between pumpkin plants. So there is a lot of ground that is open and exposed before pumpkins really cover up the rows. And we see consistently over the last five years a one to 2% weed occurrence in our fields. On our conventional pumpkins, we are putting down a single pre-emerge herbicide, a dual, uh, and that's the only herbicide you can really use on pumpkins, a dual sandia, I believe. Uh, in our organics, we said, this is why we're trialing it in our conventional fields. Can we roller crimp this down and see weeds without that pre-emerge? We see a little bit of weeds, um, especially if your stand is very poor. If you have a poor stand, I would come through and, and mow and mulch. Um, we see when you roller crimp with a poor stand of cover, it's, there's, it's really hard. Whereas if you mow and mulch, you might be able to get through a high residue cultivator. We don't have a high residue cultivator on the farm. Theoretically, we could take one of our shank cultivators, put different feed on them, and maybe get through some high residue. Um, but we try not have to rely on that. So, is that a question? So, question is if we've done everything um, on our irrigated ground, or have you had any uh, dry situ dry field situations? For roller crimping, it's all been on our irrigated ground. We did some dry fields the last couple of years where we put them into a red clover, established a really red, heavy red clover, strip tilled into that red clover and put uh, sunflowers down. We did it on both irrigated and non-irrigated ground. The irrigated ground, it was sort of uh, a waste to put it on irrigated ground because I think we ran the system three times. That red clover uh, and sunflower, for some reason, having that living cover. We didn't roll or crimp it. It was just a living red clover cover. Um, in the trials, we mowed areas of it. The mowed areas did perform better in terms of germ for that sunflower uh, than the unmowed areas of red clover. But the dry land and the irrigated land was very, very similar yield. I think the dry land had a little bit of a decreased yield. I'm pretty sure it had decreased yield. But that, that irrigated ground, we ran that system three times maybe, and then the field south of it that had kidney beans with a traditional cultivation. I couldn't tell you how many times we ran it around. I don't know, eight, ten, quite a few. So just having that living red clover, uh, and sunflower is not a huge um, a water need crop, but we thought with having that living red clover how that would work. But that worked for us well on the dry land pieces we were managing. Um, a dry land, that's about the only sort of intercropped, reduced tillage method we've used on dry land. Everything else has been conventional, um, like in terms of clean field and then cultivating. We don't have a lot of dry land experience. Do you have a question? Um, in the, when you roller crimp the rye and the soybeans, you said you did it what, five, ten days late. So after we planted? After we it, I think it was two weeks. Beans were about V2, V3. V3. Okay, that's my question. Yep. Uh, okay, so yeah, the question on when do you roller crimp the beans after, yeah, so two to three weeks. Um, something we also do on our soybeans is in a clean cultivation field at between V2 and V5, we'll take a big flat land roller and roll all of our beans down. Um, we find we see a five to eight bushel increase every acre we do that on, and our roller paid for itself in that first year. Uh, note on that, we do it when it's hot, and then right after we're done, we irrigate. So if, if you don't have irrigation, 
you would need to look at your rain days coming and you know how how viable do you think you can pop those soybeans back up so i saw another hand somewhere where was i seeing things more questions So why we think we're getting a yield increase from rowing, rolling, and I think the same theory carries through for the roller crimping. Um, what we're seeing when we roll it down is we see uh, breakage on those soybeans on the branches. So we're seeing a lot more branching out there. So we think it's partially because the soybeans are damaged, so they have more a branching effect afterwards. And then the second reason is we have a lot less shatter loss as the combine goes through the field. It's a very flat field. There's no hills, there's no bumps. Uh, when we go out and we take our measurements of shatter loss uh, with our hula hoop, it's very scientific. Um, we, we, we see a lot less shatter loss on those fields. Um, any of our research too that you are interested in, my background is research, so we try and take, uh, we try and have controls, uh, plan dates of observations or measurements yield results or some sort of results that, that have a quantitative effect um, rather than, you know, we think this looks better. We really try and make it sure that we have some numbers to put down on paper that we can run an analysis on. Any other questions or? I don't quite hear your question, I'm sorry. So how many times do we go through the field on the beans or sensitive crops with a tine hair or rotary hoe? If we're not cover cropping? Uh, we're typically seeing about eight to 10 passes of cultivation passes. On, we're probably like six to eight on our soybeans because those can close our rows a lot quicker. On our dry edible beans, we're more like the eight to 10. You're gonna have a lot more passes through the field. So we've calculated out typically our machine cost for pulling a cultivator through the field is about nine or ten dollars. It's not as much as a as a full land a disc or the Reuben nine. The, those are a little more like twelve dollars per acre for your passes. So we've broken down our costs. So if you're going through the field, um, let's say ten times, it's ten dollars a pass. It's a hundred dollars an acre on your cultivation costs for the year. What kind of cut? That's what brought us to this intercropping. We're going to have to make two or three passes probably. Let's count four just in case when we're gonna put an intercrop down. So it's $40 of cultivating. But then we've got $60 left over of cover cropping. Plus all the man hours that your, your, your crew or you can be doing something else and focus your energies on. So that was one of our driving factors to move us to that intercropping was how much time is it taking? How many dollars does it cost? Could we replace this practice with one that would save us time? but also have a really nice benefit of soil health. So when we sit around our farm and have agronomic conversations about any of our practices, I'm always the one like, soil health, soil health, just remember soil health. <laughs> um, so it's really important that if you keep repeating that topic to yourself, eventually you start thinking in that mind frame of not just, you know, dollars, man hours, you know, what, you know, can I keep, keep the farm going and contracts, if you start to think of that soil health, it's going to cost money, but eventually it, it saves you money. Yeah. Uh, will you mow and mulch the, um, the rise, you know, like roller crimping didn't work? Is there a mower and mulching equipment that you recommend? So the question was on when we mow or mulch the rye yeah, so and mulch it. We didn't do really a mulch. I think when I was talking mulching, we would just cut it and leave it, and that we called it a mulch. Um, so was there equipment that we could recommend? We f used a flail mower. Uh, we don't have forage equipment, so our shop foreman who has cows came through with his mower and mowed it, and then he got to bale. Um, he didn't charge us because we told him he could bale these 30 acres and these we want left, and he did it for us without cost. Um, there's some really interested, interesting research coming out of Germany that I'm following. Um, it's at, uh, what's the university in Hanover? Uh, if you're interested in it, I've got my cards up here and you can come and take a card and you can email me. I'll email you our slideshow. Um, I can email you pictures if you're interested or some of the research I'm following. 
There's a researchers out of Germany, what they're doing in a potato production is they have a really robust living cover. They're mowing it all, they're collecting it, they're mulching it, I don't know how. And then they're putting it back, once they build the hills, they're mulching back over their hills. And they're seeing an incredible reduction in weed, pests, and disease in an organic production. Um, so it's something we're looking at very seriously, uh, at getting mulching equipment to basically harvest this cover, turn it into mulch, and being able to spread it back on the field, um, particularly for our dry beans. Because when you have cultivator blight on your dry beans, you could really, um, it can be okay, or it can be really bad. <laughs> so, Anders? So an Araya-based soybean system, talking about no-till versus strip-tilling. Um, we used to do a lot more strip-tilling with our soybeans and for that soil to seed contact, but when we started to trial, like just planting straight into the beans, we're seeing we're still having a very good stand without needing the strip-till. However, our strip-till is set up to put on amendments at four and eight inches. So we really like having that ability to put some of these amendments through our strip-till. It's a liquid strip-till. Um, you can get a dry strip till as well to put dry amendments through. So we're having some, depending on what you, our goal, we typically search for a four and eight inch zone that we're putting these amendments down on. Any other? Andres has a... Uh, can you talk about what amendments you're using? Uh, what amendments we're using? Fish is one. It's very smelly. Uh, <laughs> then we're using uh, man. So the other, one of the other managers on the farm is Eric. He's my husband, and he could give you all these names of all the amendments with all their prices uh, with this fancy spreadsheet he built um, that I can't recall them at this moment. I know a humic base is one of them. Um, I don't think a compost seed. We're going to try some compost seeds this next year. I know fish is one because I helped mix it. <laughs> it's really smelly. And if you're really interested in knowing some of our fertility programs for any of our organic crops, please email me. We'll email you them. Um, we're, our thought is farming has become very closed between um, farmer to farmer. We're very much wanting to change that culture in terms of if you're having a problem or you're going to start an organic and how the heck do you plan to do a corn crop and try and put on 150 units of nitrogen without trying to put on all dairy manure? Just Feel free to email us and we can see if, give you some sort of light there. Other questions or comments? I think we still have a couple minutes if anyone has a comment. Everyone has learned everything they need to know. <laughs> I'm amazing. Wow. Thanks, guys. Nothing else? Uh, feel free to grab a card. Honestly, email me any other questions you have on conventional, organic, wanting to know our fertility programs, seed selection, I'll, we'll email them out to you. So thank you.